So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Xiao Yuan, and I go by Ethan. I'm an undergraduate researcher in Chongshi's lab. And the project uh, I'm going to present today is about using survey weight to account for participation bias in the UK Biobank. So here's a table of contents for my uh, presentation today. Uh, after providing some background about my project, I will begin discussing each of the four questions that I'm trying to answer in this project. Uh, so how to develop survey weights with limited information on uh, non-participants and are our survey weights uh, informative? Um, what phenotypes GWAS may be substantially affected by participation bias and uh, how do we how can we use these uh, developed survey weights to adjust for participation bias in GWAS? So first, some background introduction. Um, so what is participation bias? Uh, participation bias is basically the uh, non-representative study outcome due to systematic differences between participants and non-participants in the study. So specifically for UK Biobank, it invited uh, 9 million people in order to get their 500,000 uh, participants. So their participation rate is only 5.5%. And uh, as you can see here, uh, they invited like 9 million people, but uh, about 6 million of them uh, didn't actually respond to their invitations. And uh, eventually their sample population is only 500,000. Uh, but more importantly, um, when, what, what makes us to think that there's a participation bias is that uh, these UK Biobank participants are more likely to be older, to be female and live in less socioeconomically deprived areas than non-participants. So, uh, it's, you know, it is not very representative of the invitees and hence the outcome of the studies conducted using these samples may not apply very well on the population of interest. But how exactly does uh, participation bias affect genetic association studies? There are many answers to this question and here I will just discuss uh, the very basic scenario where participation act as a collider. So the picture on the left is called a uh, directed acyclic graph, aka DAG, and the arrow uh, represents direct causal effect. So in the picture here, we are saying that SNP1 has a direct causal effect on trait one, but it's not associated to uh, trait two in the population. However, if we con condition on P, which is participation, i.e. if we look at the relationship between SNP1 and trait two within uh, the participants, then it opens a pathway between SNP1 and TRAIT2. So this is the open pathway between SNP1 and TRAIT2. Uh, so, so basically, if you run a GWAS on TRAIT2, SNP1, which is included in your GWAS model, will have a biased non-zero effect size estimate, where if you do this in population, you, there is actually no you know, association between SNP1 and TRAIT2. Great. So sounds like we have a very well-defined problem, but somewhat, somewhat surprisingly, uh, participation bias in the UK Biobank didn't actually catch too much attention from the field in the past few years. What you see here is probably all the papers on this topic so far. So to briefly summarize, some of these papers proposed measurements of participation within the UK Biobank and examine the underlying genetic components of participation and some of them access the phenotypic similarity between UK Biobank samples and the general population. The conclusion they got is that the SNPs are indeed associated to participation through complex pathway, and uh, some socio-demographic factors uh, as well as health outcomes are very different between UKB participants and the general population. And I would also wanna highlight this uh, about archive preprint. Uh, where they actually run a GWAS on a trade, a uh, binary trade sex. So the idea here is, is this is actually a very clever design is that sex, sex should not have any um, SNP based heritability. But uh, if there is any SNP based heritability, that means that um, 
your sample has um, participation bias. And uh, they actually use this to demonstrate that um, you know, there's participation bias exists in a lot of cohorts. So is there any question uh, before I jump into the next part? Great. So uh, part of the reason why uh, there, there are not so many papers on this topic is because we have very limited uh, data available on the sample uh, on the on the people that UK Biobank uh, invites into their studies. So we have data, individual level data on participants, we, but we don't have too much too many information on the invitees. So what the table you see here is basically all the information that uh, we we as researcher got. Um, we only have the marginal distribution of four variables for um, UK Biobank invitees. And actually, as you can see from this um, contingency table, um, the UK Biobank participants actually indeed contains more female, and then it contains more older sample, uh, and they you know, usually live in less deprived region. Great. So a goal of our project uh, is basically to see if we could quantify the likelihood of participation for each UK Biobank individual with only these data on invitees. So this jumps to our first question that we try to answer. So how do we develop survey weights without non-participants data or with very limited data on non-participants? So first, what is um, survey weight? Survey weight is a, a very well, a widely used tool in the field of survey sampling. Uh, it is uh, usually defined as the inverse of participation likelihood. And it's a measurement of uh, representativeness of each sample. So basically the larger the survey weight, the more representative the sample. Uh, the intuition behind this is that uh, if your study is really special, then a sample uh, with a very small likelihood to participate in this study could be viewed as a more representative sample of the general population. So their inverse of the participation likelihood will be very large. And uh, that means their survey weight will be very large, which, which means this sample is more representative. And uh, in order to uh, calculate the survey weight for each individual, we have to estimate the participation likelihood and to estimate the participation likelihood, we use a uh, probing model. We build a probing model on all the UK Biobank invitees. So here, the Z star denote the latent variable in the probing model. And we call it the liability of participation. Uh, a common assumption is that the variance of Z star is uh, equal to one. When a person's liability exceeds certain threshold, then this person would be a participant or otherwise it will be a non-participants. So this is basically our model assumption. And uh, this threshold here is actually associated with the prevalence in the population. So what is the percentage of participants in the general population? For UK Biobank specifically, this number is about 5%. So the threshold we can calculate is approximately 1.6. Okay. So yeah, so, so, so after introducing our model, uh, we, can, we can further uh, proceed to estimate uh, the uh, survey weight. So we basically stack these uh, indiv each individual's liability into a column vector and we denote it as C star. Uh, we also stack each individual's predictors into a large matrix, which we denote as W. And uh, we use the uppercase W to denote each column of this uh, W matrix. A key assumption in our model is that Z star and W are both centered. Um, so in order to, so uh, remember that we have a problem model. In order to estimate the coefficient of the problem model, we wanna uh, use this uh, multiple linear regression least squares estimator. But uh, the fact is that we don't have the entire W here. So we can't directly calculate uh, the least squares estimate for the problem model. 
so instead, we actually consider the marginal regression uh, on each of the uh, k covariates. So the j's covariates marginal regression, the regression on the j's covariates will have a, co a regression coefficient gamma to the j, uh, which can be written in, in this form. If we stack these marginal regression coefficients into a column vector, uh, we can further written this as the diagonal matrix times uh, W transpose times Z star. And then we can you know, further deduce a relationship between the marginal linear regression uh, coefficients and the multiple linear regression coefficients in uh, our problem model. So I basically copy the, the last uh, 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 row on the, uh, on the last page uh, to here. So this is just the relationship between the multiple linear regression estimator, which is something that we wanna calculate and the marginal linear regression uh, estimator. So here, W transpose W is just a pairwise correlation of the K predictors. The reason is that we assume that W is uh, centered, uh, which th th this we assume that it can be estimated with um, the UK Baobank samples. Uh, so, so once we calculate W transpose W, we have th this term and this term. So the only remaining task here is to calculate the marginal linear estimator gamma tilde. In order to calculate the marginal linear estimator, we also need to be uh, uh, a little bit smarter because we don't have uh, data on NYTs. But what we, what we got is this uh, contingency table. So using this contingency table, we can actually uh, calculate the log odds ratio of um, each variable here. So we can actually have the uh, marginal logistic regression coefficients uh, inferred from this contingency table. And then we can find a well-known relationship between the marginal logistic regression and the marginal linear regression. So to summarize, um, the, the take home message of this model is that uh, we have limited data on the uh, UK Biobank invitees. And that limited marginal distribution can only help us to get a marginal logistic model coefficient. And our goal is to you know, estimate the coefficient of a, a problem model, which is a multiple linear coefficient. And we use the marginal linear coefficient as a bridge to bridge the marginal logistic model and the multiple linear model. Uh, so that's how we infer uh, the participation likelihood of each individual from the uh, limited data that we got here. Okay, so, we, we can, after we, so this is a problem model. So after we calculate the participation liability of each individual, we can use the problem model to estimate the uh, participation probability of each individual. And then we define the survey weight of each individual as the inverse of it, uh, of his or her participation uh, probability. And uh, here are the distributions of the participation liability within the UK Biobank and the participation probability within the UK Biobank as well as the survey weight. Um, so as we can see here, the participation probability in UQ Bell Bank that we estimate are centered around 5%, because as I just mentioned, the population prevalence, uh, like the percentage of people participating in UQ Bell Bank studies is about 5%. So um, this means that our estimates indeed make sense. So any, any questions uh, regarding to this model? Yeah, so I get that you, you want to get a sense about the average of the participation probability, but these are all participants, right? Shouldn't the empirical average be greater than 5%, conditioning on the fact that they have participated in the study? Um. The mean is actually slightly higher than 5%. Um, but since our, so this actually uh, kind of show, uh, show that our uh, marginal information is not enough, you know, not informative enough in some sense. So we cannot um, shift this mean 
uh, by a lot. Okay, yeah. Oh, I guess I was just trying to say that it doesn't have to be 5%. If it is indeed 5% actually indicates that the, you know, the, the weight isn't very informative, right? Right, uh, but we are only building this on four marginal categories of information, so yeah. <clears throat> Great, so we can estimate the participation liability of each group of an individual, and then we run a GWAS on the participation liability. Uh, we include batch and 20 principal components as uh, covariates in the, in the model. Uh, we see a mild, uh, a mild inflation in this GWAS, and uh, we, we think that this might be due to unadjusted uh, population stratification. Uh, there are actually three uh, independent significant low side in this uh, GWAS. And then uh, I actually do the local zoom plot for each of them. So this is the uh, low side on uh, chromosome two. The implicated gene here actually is associated with uh, schizophrenia risk. Uh, this is another low side on chromosome seven. Uh, it actually implicated a CFTR gene, which is the causal genetic factor of cystic fibrosis. <clears throat> Another loci on chromosome seven, uh, the implicated gene, uh, an interesting gene here is uh, GL, GLI3 uh, gene, which is related to several diseases that make uh, people grow extra fingers or toes. And this PSMA2 gene has an important role in processing class one MHC peptides. So we actually also uh, run a GWAS on, uh, so, so it's the same phenotype. So it's still a uh, GWAS on liability, but this time we didn't include 20 principal components as um, covariates. The reason why we want to see this is because we think that uh, principal components are associated, are strongly associated with region, which is one of the predictors that we use to uh, build the survey weight. And we are interested in seeing that, like suppose we don't conditioning on uh, principal components, uh, what kind of associations will we see? And uh, you know, actually see very strong inflation uh, across the genome and uh, at least score regression intercept also indicated uh, a, a large proportion, a very high uh, unadjusted um, population stratification. So yeah, so that, that so the, uh, as a summary, the earlier part is about how do we uh, build survey weight from uh, limited information on non-participants. So now uh, our next part, or next, next, next question will be, are, are our ways inf informative? Um, so before I jump into this part, is there any question about the previous part? I guess I do have a question, uh, just uh, to sort of make sure that I'm tracking. Um, what is the, like if you can just step back from uh, the equations, what is the rationale uh, of using, not using, like what is the rationale that you can tie the information that you do have to get a sense of participation or to develop these weights? Just can you recap that for me before going on? Okay, sure. So this is the picture of the uh, information that are available to us. This is actually all the information that we got. So as we see here, this is actually some marginal uh, distribution of uh, four uh, variables, sex, age, region, and uh, Townsend index, which is a measurement of um, income within the neighborhood. Uh, with, these, um, with, with these marginal distributions, we can actually calculate the log odds ratio uh, of each level. And then the log odds ratio is actually the uh, marginal logistic regression where you regress the um, participation status on each of this, each of the variable here. 
does that make sense to you? So basically, you're taking uh, the difference in these four, um, I mean, difference, I speak very loosely when I use that word, uh, of these four different, um, I'd say, variables or, or characteristics between the uh, people who were invited, because that's what you have just from the general population, and then your participants and your uh, running uh, the associations based on those differences, or I guess, um, uh, odds of participation based on those characteristics. And then you're using that sort of difference uh, to um, come up with a survey weight. Yeah, that's true. Right. So okay, thanks. This, great, great. Yeah, so using these differences, we can construct a, a marginal logistic models coefficients. And then the goal, like, our survey weight is basically a function of participation likelihood. And to estimate likelihood, we can use probability model. Uh, the probability model, the, under, uh, the latent uh, variable of the probability model follows from a multiple linear regression model. So we basically, so the problem just abstracts to how to infer a multiple linear regression coefficients uh, from a marginal logistic regression coefficient. And we use marginal linear regression as a bridge to connect these two. So that's how we use the information that are available to us to infer uh, something that we want. Right. Great question. Good. So we, we actually, we are able to estimate uh, we are able to uh, construct the survey weights, and now we are asking: Are these weights informative? Um, so first, uh, so the first analysis that we 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 did did here is that um, we think that if our weights are informative, then it must be able to predict some sort of participation measurements within the UK biobank, and uh, this. Tyro and well, at our paper just published two weeks ago on Nature Communications I actually proposed a uh, participation measurements within the UK Biobank, which is uh, participation status in the optional components. So there are four baseline optional components in the UK Biobank, and their abbreviations are here: AM, uh, FFQ, which stands for Food Frequency Questionnaire. So about the diet. This is MHQ, Mental Health Questionnaire. And this is PAS, which is physical activity studies. Um, yeah, so these are four, four optional questionnaires that you can you know, opt in and answer. So the, the paper, Terra L paper, basically proposed that um, people that participate opt into these four uh, optional components have a higher participation likelihood than the other participants in the UK Biobank. Um, so, so what we what we did here is that we we ran a logistic regression of the response status of each of these um, four optional components on the liability of participation for each individuals with twenty genetic principal components as the covariate. Uh, we actually see that uh, very significant p value, but th this is not a very good metric because the sample size of these uh, questionnaires are pretty large. And then AUC are all above uh, 50%, but still that's a very low bar. Um, but, uh, but later I will show you a more powerful analysis to demonstrate the informativeness of our uh, survey weight. That this is just a basic sanity check. We also calculate the genetic correlation of the, our estimated participation liability with um, each of these um, participation GWAS. So actually uh, in this paper, they run a GWAS of participation in uh, each of these four optional components. And then we'll calculate genetic correlation. Uh, we actually see that our liability uh, GWAS is significantly correlated to the food frequency questionnaire and the mental health questionnaire. Uh, in their paper, they actually acknowledge that this eight more AM questionnaire and the PAS questionnaire, physical activity study questionnaire, is a little bit different uh, from, it's actually very different from these two. So they actually represent a different kind of 
uh, participation mechanism. So that's in their own words. Um, and we indeed see that the cor genetic correlation between our uh, liability and these two questionnaires are, are much smaller than, than these two. Did the uh, paper you're describing do its own genetic correlation matrix among these four? So do you mean a pairwise genetic correlation between yeah. the four? Right. Uh, yes, they did. And they actually see a lower genetic correlation between the, the two that I claim to be similar to each other with the two that- but What were the magnitudes of the correlations? Were they 0.9 in general or they point more like 0.2? 0.8 or 0.9. Uh, to pairwise, yeah. Okay. Okay. So as I just said, uh, this is not a very good uh, evidence to showcase our inform the, the informativeness of, of our weight. So a second analysis that we conducted is that uh, we compare the uh, weighted average slash unweighted average uh, of high the BMI in UK Biobank uh, with the same measurement in a gold standard survey called the Health Survey for England. So this uh, gold standard survey actually uh, uh, has built a very you know, well calibrated uh, sur survey weight to account for non-response uh, bias. And uh, indeed we see that the survey weight brings the average closer to the gold standard. But it's very hard to tell that um, how this, whether this improvement is actually significant. So to demonstrate the significance, we conduct a permutation test. So the idea here is that we can define a metric that quantifies the distance between each row and the gold standard row. So the, this, the, the metric that we define here is the weighted average of the absolute uh, so the L1 norm between each group. Uh, I actually provided a uh, actual example of how to calculate this metric. So suppose that we wanna estimate the distance uh, between the gold standard and uh, the UK B weighted BMI. Then we can just calculate the absolute value distance between like each cell. And then we weight it by the sample size uh, of this cell. And then we get a weighted sum so this is basically how we get the distance between this row and this weighted row, UK Biobank weighted row and the gold standard row. And to do a permutation test, we can permute the weight. So basically we reshuffle the weight and break the informativeness of, of these weights. And each time we shuffle the weights among uh, the samples, uh, we actually get a new row, right? We can recalculate the weighted average uh, of each cell. And uh, we, when we get a new row, we can get a, we can calculate the, the distance between that new row and the gold standard row. So if we shuffle this 1,000 times, what we got is that we got 1,000 distance, like between the shuffle, the distance between the shuffle row and the gold standard row. So we have 1,000 distance. This is basically the distribution of that 1,000 distance. And we want to see that uh, what what so what is the position of the UK Bell Bank unweighted average on this, uh, on this distribution? And where is the actual UK Bell Bank weighted average on this picture? So what we see here is that the unweighted difference is actually located almost right at the center of this distribution. However, the adjusted difference, so basically the uh, weighted average, uh, the distance between the weighted average row and the uh, the gold standard row, which actually we just calculate like 0.367, right? So it's actually on the far, far left uh, of this uh, distribution. So it means that it's significantly smaller than uh, the null distribution, which means that there's something special uh, and our weights is actually indeed very informative. It can help us to bring the distance between uh, the, you know, the raw average and the calculated in the UK Power Bank closer to the gold standard average. And the same message can be, can be also see here on, on, the, on the high phenotype, right? The UK Power Bank unweighted average located almost right at the center of this empirical distribution where we got from the permutation test. 
uh, the adjusted difference is 1.102. So this is the difference between the weighted average row in the UK Bell Bank and the gold standard row. And this is also on the far, far left of the picture. And we, we can't even show here because the minimum is only 1.479. Um, so again, these two are very, um, I think, very good example of demonstrating that our weights are indeed informative and can help us to um, correct bias in some sense. Is there any question regarding to the permutation test and the results interpretation in general? Okay, great. So, so the last part in summary, we actually showcased that our weight are indeed uh, informative. And then now we wanna answer another question, which is uh, what phenotypes GWAS may be substantially affected by participation bias? So if we, we, if we can identify, say a set of phenotypes in, in this step, then we can consider, you know, what kind of adjustment methods can we use? Can we apply on these uh, GWAS to correct for participation bias? We can also use the results uh, from this um, part to see the gen underlying genetic architecture uh, of participation. So here's what we did. Uh, remember that we conducted a GWAS on participation uh, liability, right? We calculate the genetic correlation between the participation liability and 45 complex traits. Uh, so here, I'll briefly comment on this genetic correlation. It actually makes a lot of, a lot of sense, a lot of sense because as you can see, uh, our uh, liability is actually negatively correlated with almost all neurological diseases and it's negatively correlated with smoking and uh, cardiovascular diseases as well. So this, sort of implicate, sorry, this sort of uh, uh, back the point that UK Bell Bank uh, individuals are in general healthier than uh, the general population. And uh, also we can see some examples about behavioral trait here. There's a positive correlation, significant correlation between educational attainment and participation. So people with higher educational attainment are more likely to participate in UK Bell Bank. And uh, there's also a positive, cor sorry, negative correlation between BMI and uh, par uh, participation, which again showcased the uh, implica implication that uh, people from uh, people who participate in the UK Bell Bank tends to be uh, healthier. And also, height is a, a pretty good indicator of socioeconomic status. It also showcase shows that. Um, there's a positive significant correlation between height and uh, participation in uh, the UK Biobank. So indeed, um, I think this results make a lot of sense and we can identify a lot of traits that are significantly associated with participation, uh, which implies that participation is a uh, you know, highly polygenic and complex trait. Okay. So that's how we uh, how we see what phenotypes are significantly associated with participation. And uh, the last question that I'm trying to uh, answer in this paper is basically how to use survey weights to account for participation bias in GWAS. So specifically, we want to account for participation bias, bias in GWAS. Uh, of the phenotype that we identified in the earlier picture. So, um, so we actually in the, in, the, in the analysis, we use educational attainment and BMI to showcase uh, the, the significance of our methods because EA and BMI are uh, two well-powered quantitative traits that are also significantly associated with participation. Okay, so the first method that we propose is a so-called meta-analysis. Uh, this meta-analysis approach is basically divide the entire sample into uh, K equal groups. And then for each group, in each group, we conduct a, a, a GWAS, a ordinary GWAS. 
And then, so then we, we actually got, you know, 10 different GWAS summary statistics. Uh, and then we use beta hat K to denote the effect size estimate of group K. And then we use variance of beta hat K to denote the variance estimate uh, uh, of group K. And then we, 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 we the trick here is that uh, instead of using say the inverse of the variance as the meta-analysis weight, we use the mean survey weight that we constructed uh, for each group uh, to pull these effect size estimate together and got a meta-analysis uh, uh, effect size estimate. And also we, we can similarly calculate the variance of the pooled effect size estimate. So uh, I'm not showing the uh, Manhattan QQ plot here because uh, it's very hard to see because I I'm using BMI and height as example, and it's very hard to see their changes uh, simply from the Manhattan plot. But I, I, I want to showcase uh, the, the, the change in the LD score regression had a heritability estimate and the intercept estimate. We see that after using our meta-analysis approach, the heritability drops for the GWAS uh, on sex using sex as a phenotype. So remember, we, we say that uh, sex is actually, uh, like it's a null trait, it should not have any SNP heritability. But using our meta-analysis approach, um, we indeed see that the heritability drops. And also uh, the similar pattern we can see across other traits, say EA and BMI. So when we saw these results, we were actually pretty thrilled about this. But uh, later we checked the uh, standard error of our meta-analysis approach. We compare our standard error, the, the meta-analysis standard error with the regular ordinary least squares uh, GWAS standard error. Uh, we see that there's actually a very strong inflation in the meta-analysis standard error. And that kind of explains why we see this um, reduction in heritability and makes this story a little bit um, uninteresting. So although we cannot use the SNP-based heritability as an argument because our um, meta-analysis GWAS is a lack of power, it has very large standard error, we can still try to examine the heritability enrichment of top SNPs that are associated to participation. We hope to see that after an informative correction, SNPs that are highly associated with participation will explain less heritability and we use fold enrichment to quantify this. So the analysis that we did here is that we use the top 10 most significant, sorry, top 10% most significant SNPs in the participation liability GWAS to build a binary annotation. And uh, we test the enrichment uh, of regular GWAS and the meta-analysis GWAS uh, in, this, in, in these top SNPs. And then we do this analysis across three different phenotypes, sex, BMI, and EA. Across different phenotypes, we see that the fold enrichment indeed drops for the meta-analysis approach uh, with comparable um, uh, standard error uh, estimate for each, um, like for each percentage of top SNPs. So the y-axis here is the fold enrichment and x-axis here is the percentage, percentage of top SNPs uh, associated to uh, participation uh, that we include in our annotation. Any question or comments on this uh, result? Okay. So that's, that's basically the only uh, empirical results that we have for meta-analysis. And uh, another method that we try to use is the weighted least squares approach. Um, this is actually a very straightforward approach. Uh, we, we, we change the weighted least squares, the well-known weighted least squares method. We basically change the weight in this well-known weighted least squares estimator. We, we change it uh, to the our survey weight, basically. We use the survey weight to build this weight matrix in the weighted least squares estimator. And we also have this uh, 
very familiar sandwich form uh, variants uh, like this uh, effect size, the variance of the effect size estimator. Um, and uh, this uh, omega here is basically a di diagonal uh, matrix with uh, the residual, uh, uh, residual, sorry, sum, sum of squares residuals on the diagonal, yeah. So, right, and so using the weighted least squares approach, uh, in the earlier stage, we see that um, the weighted least squares approach actually brings us inflation signal in the GWAS of sex, which is um, kind of uh, weird because, you know, the way that the, as I just mentioned, the sex should be a not heritable trait. So it's, it should not even show any signal, but the weighted least squares approach actually gives inflation in, in the uh, in, in the sex, GWAS of sex. So we cannot explain this, but uh, later we, after some investigation, we are able to fix the uh, weighted least squares GWAS, which I will show you how, how we fix this in a second. But after we fix this, we, we see that when we use weighted least squares GWAS, uh, we run weighted least squares GWAS on, on sex, um, we no longer see uh, any uh, signals across the genome, which is what we expected. So, so here, here is the fix that I just mentioned. So this, there's actually a caveat with weighted least squares. So most statistical software assume heteroscedasticity for the weighted least squares function. So if, if, you, if you apply that assumption, uh, while the effect size estimator is not affected, the variance estimator actually takes a very special form. So it's no longer a full sandwich form, it's just um, sigma square, which is the uh, sum of squares residual divided by the degrees of freedom uh, times x transpose wx to the inverse. And this is uh, supposed to be smaller uh, than the full sandwich form of variance estimator. So we, we actually have a smaller uh, standard error if we uh, use this estimator. And that's why we see you know, stronger inflation uh, across the whole genome when, when we originally implement the weighted least squares. But uh, there's a similar uh, issue uh, between weighted least squares and meta-analysis approach. That is, if we co compare the weighted least squares standard error estimates, the full sandwich form standard error estimates with the regular GWAS standard error estimates, it still has a very large inflation. So it's still kind of, um, so it's kind of, you know, I'm sure that whether our GWAS actually removes some false positive signals or it's just because it's lack of power and the heritability decreases. So any questions? Uh, this is actually the, uh, the very last uh, slide of my presentation. Okay, so to summarize, um, we, we show that participation bias in UK Biobank can affect results of association studies. And uh, we demonstrate that we can actually construct surveys for UK Biobank participants based on limited information on NYTs. And these ways are indeed informative. And furthermore, we find that participation has a uh, complex, or we confirm that participation bias has, uh, participation has complex genetic architecture and it is genetically correlated with various phenotypes, which is the results that's also shown in a lot of earlier studies. Um, a, a slight issue with this project is that our proposed approach is to account for participation bias in GWAS will reduce power. So we cannot just see the, we cannot just use heritability as a metric to quantify the, uh, the informativeness of our correction. Uh, we cannot just see how the top signal changes in some sense. We need smarter design to showcase the uh, actual significance of our correction. For example, the I think the heritability enrichment argument uh, is uh, on, on, on something on this track. And we need to think about more similar analysis to sh showcase the, um, 
actual utility of our uh, proposed approaches. So I think that's all for my today's presentation. Uh, uh, do you this first any point, questions? this first point that you're making, what what are you basing that demonstration on? So this is a point that you've demonstrated that participation can can affect results. Can you clarify what you mean by like oh. actual demonstration of that? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, so today I talk about that uh, how participation bias can affect results of association studies. So it's not um, part of the paper. It's in the uh, the background part of the presentation. So I'm just giving a summary of this presentation. Okay. So you mean, the first point is that it's just to restate that it's, there's a possibility that participation bias could affect association studies. It, I'm wondering what the, um, what would you say is the best evidence that you've shown that this is a, like a possible problem? I think, again, the GWAS of sex can be a very good argument. So sex is a null trait and it's not supposed to have any uh, slip-based heritability. And uh, I think it's, we can also do some sort of um, simulation in UKBL Bank to demonstrate this. Um, but currently I think the GWAS of sex is a very good argument about this part. Yeah, um, excuse me, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, yeah, sorry, I think I have two questions. First, I mean, I mean, yeah, I know there seems to be some relatively simpler weighting methods, such as I simply use a inverse pro uh, probability weighting to force the, the UKB sample to have same distribution for these covariates at the distribution of the EMITs. So that is a relatively sim uh, simpler weight compared to your weights. And I'm wondering if your weights perform better than that kind of simpler inverse probability weights. Uh, that is my first question. And my second question is that um, how, because the, the UK Biobank EMITs are, are, are further different from the, UK, uh, from the UK population or the population of the Younger land, I think. So, how do you think about of that difference? The, uh, that differences, the the difference between the uh, UK bank bank invitees and the uh, young younger land population is. That, would you think that uh, it could lead to another bias? So the, for the first question, um, so the question is, is asking that uh, whether our weights uh, are like. We always seem, seems to have a more comp complicated structure than some yeah. you know, weights that simply take the inverse of participation likelihood as the yeah. sampling weight. Um, uh, my answer to this is that actually our weights is also taking the uh, inverse of participation likelihood. It's just that we uh, take some effort to estimate the participation likelihood of each individual. And after we get that number, we, we still take the inverse of it to um, account for participation bias. So that's the weight that we use in with the least squares approach and meta-analysis approach that I just discussed. So does, does, does this answer the first question? Okay, yeah, got that, thanks. Yeah, so, and the second question uh, you're asking is, um, is there, that there are two layers uh, of inference, right? So Right now, uh, I'm uh, the goal of this project. I think is to trying to make our participants more representative of the frame population, which is the invitees. Um, we're not uh, doing the second layer of uh, inference, like how to make the invitees more representative of the general UK population. And uh, I think, in fact, the UK biobank samples is not. Um, I think it's not in, in some sense very representative or, or it's intentionally not very representative of the general population. Uh, it has some oversampling uh, and uh, it also only includes samples that are between 40 to 69 years old. So, so, so I think the, the, the ideal goal of this project is just to uh, make the 
samples that we have here to be more representative of the sampling frame. Um, does that answer the second question? Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Oh. I have a couple of questions and, and points. Um, you know, a lot of it has to do with this. I think you used some sort of like survey data that is nationally representative to kind of, um, I think that's where you got the, like the BMI estimates that you were sort of correcting. Um, so one, I mean, one question is um, like when you show your genetic correlation table and you're like, oh, look, um, you can see that like our survey weights, you know, show, or, or like or our GWAS on the participation weights show that, you know, people are more likely to be like higher education, whatever, whatever. Um, I mean, I think one thing that's sort of funny is that I think we could have probably guessed that from the first slide, right? Um, like on the, on the, or like one of the early slides when you showed the, the actual data that you were drawing upon, like we see right there um, that, uh, you know, UKB participants are like more likely to live in less deprived neighborhoods, right? And so like, we think that's gonna be correlated with all of these things. Um, so it might be nice to sort of like, you could get a baseline um, from some sort of national representative survey of the correlates of the, sort of basically like the, um, those marginal probabilities that you're given, like basically all of the data that you're able to use comparing the invitees to the, um, to the sort of actual participants. And so you could, you could kind of make a prior of like, what would we expect based on these differences that we're observing and then compare those to like, oh, and we actually had sort of like run it through this GWAS machine, GWAS machinery and then do genetic correlations and we like sort of yield the same results. Like, so then it's sort of like a gut check. Does that make sense? Mm. I probably, uh, could you actually elaborate a little bit more about that? I probably didn't get your point, I'm sorry. Yeah, so will you just go to the, like, the data that you're using, like the marginal probabilities table? Yeah. So already from here, um, I think we can like maybe some get some sort of hypothesis or some sense of um, so if UK biobank participants are more likely to sort of live in um, sort of less or more de like less deprived areas right or they're more likely to be a certain age like based on the sort of just like the kind of survey data that's available we have a prior of well what is that going to mean for um, sort of what participation is correlated with so all, all I'm sort of saying is that we can kind of just without even doing anything with genetic data, it seems like we, we can you know, match these marginal probabilities to some sort of representative sample or, or some sample that you think matches the UK biobank invitees. And then we'll have a guess of, we can sort of get at that question of like, oh, the people in the UK biobank are selected by education or they are selected by whatever covariates you want. Um, and I was just saying, I think, I think that that would be potentially useful to compare with sort of the final kind of genetic correlation results. I see. Um... So, if we want to so you match, did a little. You did a little bit about about that with the BMI results, right? So you're matching that with a survey, and there are other papers that phenotypically try to examine the people in the UK biobank versus some other general population survey. I, I guess, so Sam, I'm wondering, like, how would you show, like, uh, what's the actual test in some sense? Like, is this test of closeness in, in some kind of generic sense? Um, but because there's no, there's no out, there's no external data that's going to so well match the UK biobank because of how they selected their samples based on like proximity to these centers. And there, so there's some, there's some, yeah. there's little bits of problems with doing a really direct test. So the question mm -hmm. is like, can you fail this test or can you pass this test that you're describing? Yeah, no, so maybe, I mean, yeah, maybe it's not like, like, I would have to think a little harder if it's sort of an explicit physical test um, versus just like, uh, it's, it, feel, it feels a little funny to kind of go through all these motions and then like, like from this first slide, I think I just have this guess, like, oh, I have some idea of what UK biobank participation bias is. And then like, to see the genetic correlation, it's like, oh, look, they are selected by education. I think maybe, maybe I'm flagging more than anything that. Uh... I think, I think the purpose of the genetic one purpose of the genetic correlation table would be to, I think, in some sense, rank the phenotypes based on how likely there's going to be a problem yeah. in the in the participation bias question. So there'll be some phenotypes that 
potentially you look at that table and say there's there's a very low genetic correlation between baldness and the liability scale to participate. And therefore, we think that a baldness GWAS is probably not going to suffer from this problem. Is that, would you say that that's a reasonable way of looking at that table, Tim? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the this is probably not totally doable. What you would really want would be like, um, like, so with EA, what's interesting is like, the EA GWAS results are both a function of sort of actual sort of genetic signal for educational attainment and this survey bias that you guys are talking about. So it's kind of interesting to think about. Uh, it's a little hard to interpret the correlation. If we think the survey bias is pretty small, then really, like it, it is telling the exact story that you're saying, but um, yeah, no, I mean, I, it's, it's, it's all just very hard. It's a hard question. The, the other thing that I thought would potentially be useful using the external data, but you know, maybe it's just not possible given that uh, this difficulty was sort of matching any sort of you know existing sampling frame onto something resembling the UKB, um, but but you know if, given that you all you all have such limited information on um, basically selection in the sample like the you know participating conditional conditional on being invited, um, I thought it might be sort of like useful to try to quantify like how noisy you expect the observed weights to be compared to sort of what like ideal weights would be, um, and, and especially if you're trying to like advocate to the UKB like hey like we need to like collect data and provide this to researchers because it matters. Like the, the, the less noisy weights that actually like, you know, so, so I mean, I guess what I'm saying here is um, like, say you had like continuous measures of a lot of things that were really important for survey weighting and like, and then like how, say that you ignore some of those variables and then you course in the other ones to end up with what you have. Like how, how well are you able to recover um, sort of the true weights with sort of your noisy weights? Um, Cause it, it, I mean, it sort of maybe gives you a prior of like, if your weights are only explaining 33% of the variance of the true weights, um, I know in some, even if you have relatively weak results, you can kind of say like, this is because we're really limited on information. Um, so it could just be a, a way to make the argument a little stronger. I generally agree with what uh, Sam said, but just about the last point, I'm not sure how exactly we can do that in the UK Bar Bank using real data, but I, I, I'm pretty sure that we can put together some simulation to show that, by the way, here is a, uh, actual performance, you have the gold standard survey weight. And if we keep adding noise to the survey weight, you get worse and worse results and maybe get a sense about just where we are in terms of the informativeness of the current weight we have been able to put together. I think that will be a useful piece of analysis in this uh, project. And then just one thing to add to this uh, current slide about genetic correlation, I think one particular analysis I would be interested in is for some traits such as EA, right? We actually, we actually have multiple sets of summary statistics, one based on the UK Bar Bank, one based on samples without UK Bar Bank, right? So I actually want to see the genetic correlation between UKB-based GWAS and non-UKB sample-based GWAS uh, to see how they correlate with the participation bias in the UKB, right? I, I would want to see some reduced genetic correlation, although I'm not entirely sure if the intuition is correct, uh, when we test the correlation with uh, non-UKB-based GWAS. Uh, but it's just that analysis is still in the works. I think uh, Ethan is trying to put together a list of uh, all the non-UKP GWAS we have, um, but eventually we will be able to see that sort of result. Totally, I mean, yeah, that makes total sense. Hi, Ethan. Uh, Hi. So my question is actually related to Sam's, but it takes a slightly different uh, turn. So. Uh, it has to do with what is the main goal of your paper um, and why you ended up using the UK Biobank. So is the main goal to come up with weights specifically for the UK Biobank and then just apply them there? Or is the main goal to come up with a way of generating survey weights for um, uh, different studies based on you know, certain characteristics and genetics and GWAS. Um, and the reason I say, like, I know that you've been looking at sort of both of those things, but the reason I say what's the main point is um, uh, why don't you use a nationally representative sample? Uh, I, I mean, this is me just sort of uh, thinking more broadly, but, um, and then within those nationally representative samples, they'll have ancillary studies which are um, 
uh, prone to selection bias. Uh, and then, and I don't know if this makes sense or if it even really works for your study, but to really use something that already has established selection where you, you're not depending on just four characteristics from the population, but you have a lot more data to base it on. Um, I, does, do you, I hope I made uh, sense in what I was saying um, so that, um, yeah, that, anyway, that's my question. I think you made a very good suggestion, but I think that suggestion might, might only apply to the case where the main theme of my project is to adjust for, in some sense, like a, a general sense of participation bias, right? Um, right, right. And so that's why I, was, I wasn't sure what the main um, goal was, like if, if the main goal was to demonstrate sort of a process or a method then it might not be great to use the UK Biobank because you don't have all of the information you need at your disposal, but if it, you know, but obviously you have other goals. So yeah, anyway, thanks. Oh, okay, so yeah, I can add uh, uh, more, uh, more explanation to this. Uh, so the goal I wanna uh, clarify is, is actually to develop a survey weight that is uh, for UK Biobank only in some sense. That's because, for UK Biobank, we have a we have a very huge limitation is that it only has um, very limited data on invitees. So our the goal of our project is say can we build survey weight on limited um, based on these limited data on invitees? Because it, like say if there's a study with uh, you know a lot of data on invitees, then this question might not be that interesting. And also UK Biobank is a cohort that's being widely used uh, by a lot of researchers. So we are seeing that suppose we can build this way that actually there might be, you know, very wide applications. So that's two main reasons why, you know, we are um, actually only building this on the UK Biobank. Kristen, do you have a question? Could you unmute yourself? Sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I've been I've been trying to I think I'm I'm rap, I'm grappling with sort of similar things to what Eve is grappling on in terms of the goal. So I get that participation bias really can influence genetic associations that you might find and their ability and then and then but it also is dependent on how you want to apply those associate those GWAS results, right? So a part of me is wondering so I'm looking at these participation rates, right? And I see them as an issue. So we, you, there's definitely older adults. I don't know why or how that would alter necessarily the genetic associations seen in your study. Um, but the regional data, you do see slight differences by region. I'm just wondering if there's, and, and then the other issue is, is this male female participation issue. Um, so would it make sense to just sort of stratify your results your GWAS results because there's so much data as opposed to trying to really create these, you know, rather than, you know, alter the the confidence intervals around the GWAS results by weighting, would it make more sense to also look at how robust these associations are within in different strata, like just amongst women or just amongst men? I mean, I don't know that that, because the goals really of the GWAS are, is there a genetic association, right? Not necessarily how tight can our I mean, I understand this. This is interesting and it's fascinating. I like the work a lot. I'm just trying to figure out what what problem you're trying, I guess what the problem you're trying to solve is other than participation bias. Yeah, it really is an issue. But if you're really trying to ask the question of how strong is there a genetic association between these different factors, is participation bias really that big of an issue? Um, when you know that genetic cluster genetics clusters by all these other things, right? And couldn't you just stratify by those different clusters of things to see if you see different effect modification and or associations in, within different strata? It's just a different approach to the same problem. Do you see what, uh, yeah, I, I think that's a thing. I, 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 thanks for the question first. I think that's a very fair comment. Uh, and indeed, so actually, so the method that I proposed, uh, this, sorry, this meta-analysis approach is in some sense, indeed, uh, what, what you just said is 
also stratified, right? So, it, so right now I didn't say that how many groups are we uh, partitioned these samples into. So you can consider a very extreme case where the number of groups is just the number of stratums, right? So um, let's say that, you know, we can do a full, you know, cross tabulization of these variables. Like eventually we got to say 400 categories and then we, we divided the whole, the entire samples into 400 different groups where people in each group are entirely homogeneous. And then we run a GWAS and then conduct this meta-analysis on it. Um, yeah, and I think I think that comes. I think it, the question really comes from when we're thinking about survey research and generalizability of the results that we have. Um, you know, how important is it to say that within this particular sample of people that we know is potentially biased with respect to participation? These are the associations we see, as opposed to this is these are the associations amongst a representative sample of all of the UK, right? So in my mind, that's how we think about weighted versus unweighted data, and then sort of um, also adjustments to the variance estimates accounting for some some of those different um, participation rates and bias that might might occur, right? And so that's where it starts to get a bit tricky. But this is helpful. Thanks. Hey. Hey, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but it's sort of a way of restating the question like, um, to what extent are we worried about the UKB being non-representative versus, so like the associations that are like found in the UKB being sort of correct, but sort of not externally valid to a lot of interesting populations versus to what extent do we think the associations in the UKB are just like incorrect, like biased because of collider bias and other things like that? Like that's well, sort of an interesting. Right, and those are the two questions, but the latter question really is biased in what respect, right? Like what you see is what you see, right? <laughs> in terms of associations. So there's there's internal validity and there's external validity. Um, I think issue. that's, I mean, I, I think that's right, but I think the UKB, as you know, has this novel feature that it's used, the results of the UKB is, are used as inputs for like every other analysis, like I see. scores right. and so on. So it like has this special standing in two huh? ways. Uh -huh. One special standing is that it's so big that it's used, you know, all the time as an input for other analyses. Mm -hmm. And it has a special standing of being particularly terrible at describing their participation issues, like particularly unwilling to provide the information that they actually have in house. They could like they could be doing all this themselves and they, were, and they don't. Uh -huh. uh, like this contingency, t this table that Ethan has is the only information that they'll publicly distribute. But of course, they know all this in house. Like they could do all the things that you should they they should be doing. So it's partly just a demonstration of the consequence of not pursuing what all other studies would have pursued of of evaluating participation bias. But that that itself, I don't think, would be important if if it weren't to me if it weren't the case that every other study that uses summary statistics and generates polygenic scores has a huge part of the UKB in it, right? So you're porting yeah. over this problem to every yeah. study. Like if that wasn't true, then I think this would be of limited consequence. It would just be showing that the UK Biobank ha has this potential problem. What, what's your view of that? Yeah, no, I think that latter assessment is really, <laughs> brings it all home, right? So that's what I was trying, I think that was the missing piece in my own head in terms of the rationalization of the tremendous amount of work that this takes to get to where you need to be. But now, yeah, I see that. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. It doesn't say yet that it's important, I think. I think that there's some, there's some possibilities that Ethan outlined of why it could be important, but I don't think it, there's been a slam dunk case yet about it actually changes the summary statistics that you're reporting in to show or HRS or anything else. Mm -hmm. But I do think the application of these data as sort of generalizable or the, the gold standard then makes it really important to be explicit about what the, the participation bias might do to the estimates that you have and how this potentially unrepresentative or you know, all the issues that are inherent in population health research are doing to sort of the associations that we see. So I, that makes sense. 
Yeah, I would just add that. I think the two biggest, maybe the only biggest struggle we are, we're facing right now is how do you know the weight is better than not using anything? Uh, you know, uh, Ethan just presented two ideas. Um, one is based on the meta-analysis approach, another is weighted least square. He actually tried a few more options um, sort of behind the curtain. And uh, um, uh, these methods either doesn't change anything or gives you weird differences downstream that, that are sometimes difficult to interpret. So then I'm just wondering, or we are just wondering, you know, in general, if you are able to come up with a weight, how do you really demonstrate that this is better? You know, we, we sort of look into literature. I think some of the examples that involve comparison between the weighted uh, BMI and height estimate versus a gold standard uh, estimate is sort of um, along the same direction compared to some of the papers we've seen in the field. But when you try to demonstrate, say, associations between genetic markers and the phenotype, and suppose we have an informative weight, how, how really uh, should we uh, approach this? I think any comments on, on you know, uh, methods to correct for these weights in association study or what kind of uh, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, numerical experiments you would like to see to be convinced that this actually works will be very helpful for our future directions. Yeah, I would I would argue that maybe the application to how these unweighted versus weighted, you know, like the unweighted results might be applied to other GWAS and or the weighted results are applied. Um, or even sort of where how variance changes around different point estimates and the polygenic scores and the other things, as Jason said, some examples of how those results might be impacted by weighted versus unweighted would be probably really informative and illustrative because it gives you some sense of confidence around the robustness of the data that you see, whether you're accounting for participation bias or not. Totally, and I mean, and specifically, it seems to me like the bias that gets in to the like, if there's bias that's getting into sort of the estimated effect sizes from a GWAS because of, um, sort of the selection into genotyping, like then, or sorry, selection into, you know, participation, then I think it resembles sort of like bias from just like more maybe like general kind of like cryptic population structure in that like it's indexing like not causal variation. Um, so maybe sibling comparisons versus non-sibling comparisons are useful here where like if your weights are working well and they're reducing this sort of like non-causal genetic effect very like bias, then shouldn't, you not see as much decrease moving from, you know, using un predicting an unrelated then because like the weights, you know, the if there's bias, it's going to predict an unrelated too, uh, probably just because it's capturing sort of like, you know, meaningful demographic characteristics of the people. But then if you move to within families or some sort of family based analysis, like, then it seems like the weight, like the, the, to the extent that the variation uh, in the effect sizes is due to like just this bias, then then that's just going to hurt prediction. So maybe there's some sort of comparison there that would be useful. I think that is a good point. And we, in, in, in fact, we have thought about it. It's just, I'm not sure we have fully understood that yet. Uh, one tricky issue is, uh, let's say we use uh, the 17,000 sibling pairs in the UKB to investigate this. Then the fact that these siblings are all in the UKB also tells us something, you know, these people must have higher liability of participation. Then in a way, this is not a gold standard data set, right? I'm just not entirely sure how that will bias the ultimate inference. So if you run a sibling based analysis to, to see if the polygenic score based on our corrected version of the GWAS will have a say reduced effect size or something. I, I'm, I think just another factor we need to account for in this is uh, is the, the, the sibling data itself is subject to the same kind of bias. Um, so there's a bit of nuance. But, yeah, but I in think general, I agree point. with what you said. Yeah. yeah, no, maybe using a different, if only there was sort of a big sibling group in a different data set that would be useful. In some sense, the siblings in the UKB are like double selected, right? Because they, you know, there's plenty of people probably who uh, had two siblings invited to participate and then only one did, right? And that's sort of a, a different group than the, like the subset of people who both siblings agreed. Um, so yeah, I think that's a great point that it's even, it's even a weirder group uh, with respect to selection than like the UKB as a whole. 
That's right. And, and uh, just because we are using some general demographic covariance to build these survey weights, these are not very distinguishable between siblings, right? They tend to be more likely to be from the same regions, from the same, uh, uh, you know, uh, regions with similar uh, towns and index, and maybe even like age distribution will be similar. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I think it's not key for there to be variation in the weights between siblings, because you would just be basically getting, you wouldn't be using the siblings to generate um, the betas, you would just be using them in sort of like the follow-up polygen explore analysis, right? So I don't, I'm not sure that that would be a problem, but I don't know, maybe I'm not thinking about it right. I'm not sure either. Um, I just have the intuition that somehow in the UK bio bank, because of the participant bias, siblings are more similar than they will be if you actually randomly select siblings uh, from a general population. But yeah, what yeah. I'm not sure about is just how, how that will affect the, the analysis you proposed. So. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, so in general, I think any comments, feedback will be appreciated, but I, I do want to make sure uh, to make the point. So. Uh, you probably don't feel that this is a presentation from undergraduate student. So this is just uh, uh, just remarkable. And so, so Ethan did a lot of work putting everything together. Uh, before we started this, uh, none of us, I think it, all this started from Jason's idea that you know, the UK Bank had a 5% participation rate, which is uh, very low compared to what you would like to have. Uh, uh, and, and you know that seems to be a big difference between a participant and non-participant. But then Ethan really was the one who looked into the literature, uh, figured out you know how we should approach this. Uh, read the papers by Nobel-winning economists, uh, you know, studying how people uh, talk about this, um, I, 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 and be because we didn't have any pre previous experience on this topic. And as you can see, he was able to construct the weights, demonstrate the weights are informative, um, and even ran GWAS on the weight, which is a very novel phenotype, right? Um, uh, we haven't really seen a GWAS on UKB participation. Uh, this will be the very first on that. Um, uh, it's just, we still have this final problem, which is, uh, does it really make a difference? <laughs> if we are able to demonstrate that by applying some correction, um, it, it, it reveals you know, a better uh, a version of GWAS everybody should be doing. I think that will be uh, really impactful in the field, but we, ha we, haven't, we don't have 100% confidence that we have achieved that. You know? So, so, but I, in general, I think even without that, this should still be a publishable work and maybe we should get it out uh, because it's fair uh, to say that nobody has uh, proposed that any way to correct for sample weight in GWAS uh, literature at all. Um, uh, still, if anyone has ideas about how, how, how they want to use these weights or how we should use these weights, uh, just let us know and we'd definitely be happy to talk. I, I agree with all that. Thanks, Ethan, for a wonderful presentation. We're going to uh, close out today and, and again, like you said, invite questions. So I think we're, cl we're close to the end to this. I think we, there's a couple more things to do, but I, there's a lot that's already, Ethan's already done with it, which is great. And just to remind everybody that we'll do a um, journal club meeting that you've got in your email about Yushang uh, a week from today. Uh, so we'll, we'll see you all back then. And if Q and Ethan could stay for just a minute, I want to ask a couple more questions. Of course. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>